Okay, it is right at four o'clock. Um, before I begin, I just want to say that if you are an educator and would need uh, some clock hours, there's a sign up sheet at the back there. Mm -hmm. um, and also, we uh, soon have printed out a lot of flyers that can be distributed. So, and, and there are 10 copies each. So, if you want to take some of the flyers that will be distributed for future announcement of seminar, please feel free to do so. My name is Sun Lee Tech. I am one of the co coordinators alongside Su Ken. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Sarah Kostick is a Midwestern from Minnesota. <laughs> I don't know why that is important, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is important. Oh, yeah, that is yeah. very important. Yes, yes. Uh, Sarah uh, received her bachelor's degree in biological sciences at, Uni at Michigan Techn Technological University. Uh, and then she then started a master's program at University of Minnesota from 2014 to 2016. And that was where uh, I overlapped a, a couple of years with Sarah Kostick. Uh, so when she was doing her master's, she was supervised by uh, Neil Anderson and um, Emily Hoover. In summer 2016, she joined Kate Evans' Home Fruit Breeding Program, where she'll be sharing with you some of the groundbreaking stuff that she worked on uh, Apple Fire Blight. So I'm not going to make a fool of myself, so I'm going to hand it to Sarah. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, and hopefully I don't disappoint with the supposed groundbreaking uh, work here. So, I'm going to be talking about enabling more efficient development of fire blight resistant apple varieties. And what I hope you take away from this talk is not necessarily everything about fire blight, but how difficult and the challenges that are associated with developing a new variety, no matter what trait you're looking at. We're going to look at this specific trait, but keep in mind that there are a multitude of different traits. Now, before I get into that, I like to do my acknowledgments at the beginning so I don't forget all of these people and funding sources that have made this work possible. I obviously didn't do this work alone. Um, no graduate pr program happens in a vacuum by an individual. So my collaborators, Dr. Jane Arelli is a plant pathologist on this project, Sun Lee Tay, my advisor, Kate Evans, and then the WSU Apple breeding program team that have done a lot of the work <coughs> right alongside me. In my so to make sure that we are all on the same page, I know this is going to be reviewed for some of you, and this, for some of you, it will be new information. So what is fire blight? Fire blight is a potentially devastating bacterial, bacterial disease in apple and pear caused by Erwinia amblyvora. And this bacterium can infect the flowers, fruits, shoots, and roots of the stock of the tree. And the real issue with fire blight is that it can cause severe structural damage and potentially tree death. And this can cause some uh, significant economic damages depending upon the year and how much we have to control the disease. So in recent decades, Apple industries worldwide, and specifically the apple industry in Washington State, have become more vulnerable to fire blight epidemics. And this is for a multitude of reasons. But one of the biggest ones is that the commercial cultivars that are currently grown are all pretty much susceptible to some extent to fire blight. And they're more susceptible than older cultivars like they're delicious. They've improved fruit quality, but they're susceptible to fire blight. Now, higher density planting systems, although these increase the efficiency of the overall production system, they also enable an easier spread of the disease if you have high pressure. And this is all exacerbated by the fact that our current control methods are unsustainable, costly, and only partially effective. So if we think about cultural practices, removal of that diseased wood through pruning, that's very labor intensive and inefficient at large scales. And then if we think about the challenges with antibiotics. So antibiotics are typically sprayed at the floral phase of the disease so that we can control that initial point of infection. But these have some challenges, right? The pathogen population, just like in human diseases, can develop resistance. And it has poor efficacy against the shoot phase of the disease, which is fundamentally that phase that causes the structural damage and potentially death. And then they're no longer permitted in organic systems. So what can we do in the long term? to make sure we have a more sustainable apple production system from a fire blight standpoint. Well, as my title would suggest, you think breeding is a good way to go. So a potential long-term solution is to breed new apple varieties that have both high fruit quality as well as genetic resistance to fire blight. So the program that I work for, the WSU Apple Breeding Program, has the goal to produce a portfolio of new, improved, unique apple cultivars that are especially selected for the environment of Central Washington. 
This is Apple is fundamentally a product that is consumed by consumers. We are primarily focused on eating quality, appearance, and storability. So those are the three major ones. That's what we're really focused on. But there are other targets that would increase the overall efficiency and sustainability of the production system. So things like regular cropping and, of course, disease resistance. And as Fireblade has become more of an issue, Fireblade has become a bigger and more important target of the program. Now, to give you an idea of the length and how many resources have to go into a breeding process, I like to put up the breeding scheme. So this is one cycle of the breeding program. So in that first year of the breeding, a breeding cycle, we choose parents to cross together, typically two cultivars or two advanced selections. One is the pollen parent or the father, and one is the mother. We cross those together, and those result in hybrid seeds, full sibling seeds. But each of those seeds are genetically distinct, just like you and your siblings are genetically distinct from them. Those seeds are planted, grown up in the greenhouse, and then each of those seedlings are propagated onto a rootstock. So one seedling results in one tree. These are planted in our phase one stage of the breeding program. So in phase one, it's unreplicated. There's only a single tree per seedling. And at this phase, we're really just looking for something that has potential to be evaluated further. So we're primarily focused on fruit quality at that stage. If something shows a lot of potential in phase one, we will propagate more trees, so more clonal replicates of that individual or selection, and evaluate it in phase two. Phase two is that data collection phase. We're trying to find out as much as we can about that selection so that we can really determine does it have potential. And if it does, we will propagate even more trees and evaluate them in phase three. And that phase is really focused on commercial viability. So in each of these phases, the number of genetically distinct individuals decreases because we're narrowing down our pool. But the number of replicates or trees for those individuals increases because we want to evaluate them further. So from cross to variety of release, it takes about 25 to 30 years, which is a long time. It's a lot of resources that get dumped into developing variety. So as apple breeders, we're always looking for new ways or ways to increase the overall efficiency and precision of the breeding program. And in recent decades, apple breeding programs have become more precise and efficient through the use of DNA information. So this is referred to as DNA informed breeding. And we use DNA information, specifically DNA markers, in a variety of breeding decisions. So choosing parents to cross and selecting seedlings. And we'll talk about those two in a little bit in more detail, so you have an idea of what I'm actually talking about. But as you can imagine, the use of DNA information has several advantages over just traditional breeding. First of all, you have increased efficiency. Remember, we're starting out with a really, really big pool of seedlings. We want to be able to narrow those down to the individuals that have the most potential. So if we can eliminate basically the garbage early on, the better, the more efficient that that process is. And that results in some potential cost savings. Now, if we're thinking about breeding for disease resistance, we want to have multiple resistance genes pyramided or stacked in a given individual. Because just like a pathogen can overcome uh, antibiotics, it can overcome basically a resistance gene. But if we have multiple, the resistance is more sustainable or durable. And fundamentally, the use of DNA information boils down to a more precise choice earlier on in the breeding process. So how do we use DNA information? Well, one of the most efficient and useful ways of using DNA information is DNA-informed parent selection. So apple breeders have extensive knowledge of parent phenotypes, or the visible characteristics of the parents they use to cross. So the type of fruit that they produce, disease resistance, et cetera. But parent phenotypes are not necessarily completely predictive of what the progeny are going to look like. What are the seedlings and how are they going to react? Just like in human families, what parents look like doesn't necessarily indicate what the kids are going to look like or ever. And we have several DNA tests for several traits, such as for quality traits and susceptibility to some diseases. So I'm going to walk you through an example of how we use DNA um, information for selecting parents. So these DNA tests are for specific genetic locations or loci or locus in the genome that are associated with the trait of parents. So we're going to look at this example. We're going to cross a resistant parent by a susceptible parent. This is for illustration purposes only. We're not even, we don't care really about what this disease actually is. 
So let's say we have a DNA test that's associated with a location that's associated with resistance and susceptibility. So at every location, an individual has two alleles or two genetic copies, right? One that's been inherited from the dad, one that's been inherited from the mom. And those alleles are what really result in what we see, the phenotype. So this resistant parent has big R, little r, and that combination results in resistance. That susceptible parent has little r, little r, results in susceptibility. So if we cross these two together, the question is, what will we get in the progeny population? What percentage of seedlings are going to show susceptibility versus resistance? So if you remember back to your high school biology, when you talked about Gregor Mendel and his peas, and you did some Punnett squares, this is exactly the same thing, right? So we have the resistant parents alleles on the, on the left there, the susceptible parents alleles on the, on the top, and those are the potential combinations you can get in seedlings. So we should get a one-to-one -one ratio, or 50% of our seedlings should show resistance. So this is really useful information. We know from the visible characteristics of, this, of these parents what, that they're resistant and susceptible, and we know why. So let's say we make this cross. We have these seedlings, we generate these seedlings, and we plant these seedlings. And we want to eliminate the seedlings that have the highest potential to show susceptibility. So we want to get rid of those little r, little r combinations. We do a tissue sample, we do the DNA test, and we get rid of, we throw away the seedlings that have that little r, little r combination. So we reduce our pool to the individuals that have the highest potential to perform well for this specific trait, right? We're thinking about a lot of different traits, but it's for this specific trait. So great, we have these tools. So why are we using them for fire blight resistance and susceptibility? Well, breeding for fire blight resistance has its challenges just like breeding for everything anything else. So the biggest challenge with fire blight resistance and susceptibility is that most sources of resistance, as with many diseases, have been characterized in wild genetic backgrounds with poor fruit quality. So these are crab apple types. I have Everest there as an example. And those have really, really poor fruit quality. No one wants to eat that on a commercial level. And so you can imagine that we can use those as parents, but it's going to take a really, really long time before we get to a variety that has both high fruit quality and disease resistance. <laughs> So that's the first challenge. The second challenge has to do with phenotyping. And when we talk about phenotyping, we're talking about evaluating the visible characteristics, so evaluating resistance and susceptibility. So the incidence and severity of disease is strongly influenced by several factors outside of the resistance of a given host or a given individual. So things on the host side are tree vigor, tree age will impact disease, incidence and severity. Things on the pathogen side, so the strain of the bacteria that you have, the amount of bacteria you have present, and then environmental factors. So things like temperature, humidity, and precipitation. So you can imagine that we have to account for a lot of factors in order to evaluate disease resistance and susceptibility. And then this is compounded by the fact that different studies have utilized different methods to evaluate. So they've focused on different phases of the disease, like floral versus shoot. They've evaluated using different strains of Erwinia and Lavora. They've used different inoculation procedures, and then they've evaluated in different environments, which means that we get results all over the map when we're trying to um, compare results from one study to another. So we need some standardization. Fire blight resistance is also what we call quantitative resistance, the trait that's controlled by multiple genes from the genome. And so what I mean by quantitative, it, quantitative is that we don't just get a dichotomy. We don't just see resistant and susceptible. We see a spectrum of resistance and susceptibility, which makes it challenging to breed for resistance. And then Apple itself is difficult to work with. It's got long generation time, self incompatibility, and high heterozygosity, which means we get a lot of variation. It's very difficult to integrate this trait while increasing the fruit. So what do we need? to breed efficiently for fire blight resistance. Well, first of all, we need robust phenotypic information. We need to know what's resistant and what's susceptible so we can make those decisions when we're choosing parents. We need elite sources of resistance. What I mean by that are individuals that not only have resistance or reduced susceptibility, but also have higher fruit quality so we can more quickly get to a final variety. And then we, we would greatly benefit from predictive DNA tests for use in DNA-informed breeding. But before we can develop DNA tests, we first have to know what loci 
or what genetic regions are associated with this trait. So we can't develop DNA tests without knowing where in the genome um, actually control these, this trait of interest. Okay, so this leads me to two objectives that I'm going to talk about for my dissertation work. So the first objective was to characterize phenotypic variation of far blight resistance and susceptibility in, the, in a basically breeding relevant germplasm set. So when I talk about characterization, all we're talking about is evaluating or phenotyping resistance and susceptibility so that we get an idea of what's resistant, what's susceptible, and what is the variability for that in our germplasm. So we have to understand that before we can even look at the DNA level. And then once we understand that, we can go and we can detect loci or genetic regions associated with our trait of interest in this germplasm that's breeding relevant. Okay, so let's first talk about basically phenotyping. Okay, so the germplasm set that I'm working with is a pedigree connected apple crop record set that was developed as part of a national project called Rosebreed that was focused on developing DNA based tools for use in Rosebreed's crop breeding programs. Now this set of germplasm consists of small pedigree connected fulcid families. So these are families that have resulted from different crosses of parents. And the reason we say pedigree connected is that they all share pedigree connections to other families. So they share grandparents or cousins or great grandparents, etc. And those pedigree connections enable us to do two things. First of all, it increases our statistical power, which is really important later on for that objective too. But also it allows us to look at inheritance across generations. What's being inherited from generation to generation? Because that's fundamentally what's important from a breeding perspective. Now these full sub families provide efficient representation of important breeding parents, or what we're going to refer to as IBPs. All those are are individuals that are commonly used in these three major US apple breeding programs, Cornell University, University of Minnesota, and Washington State University. An example of an IBP would be Honeycrisp. Now, the original focus of this germplasm set was on fruit quality traits. So there's variation within these families and among these families for traits like acidity, sweetness, color, size, etc. as you can see by that image. So why in the world are we using it for far light resistance and susceptibility? Well, from a study that we published earlier this year, we know that far light resistance and susceptibility levels vary among the IBPs in the germplasm set. What we did in this study is we classified in a standardized fashion by comparing to controls, individuals that we knew going in, how they should respond. We classified the resistance and susceptibility. So in this table, I have a, a subsample of the IVPs that we looked at. And they're ordered from highly resistant to highly susceptible. So we have individuals like Enterprise and Frostbite that are highly resistant, and individuals at the bottom of the table like Granny Smith, Ginger Gold, Sansa, et cetera, that are highly susceptible. And those underlined and italicized ones are just the controls in those categories that we use to classify those individuals. So we have this variation among the parents. The question is that we want to answer in this objective, is there also variation among the progeny? Are there, is there variation for fire blight resistance and susceptibility within these full set families? So how did we go about evaluating this? Again, we have this germplasm set that contains 94 cultivars with important breeding parents. Keep those in mind, but we're not really going to talk about those today. We're really going to focus on these 314 seeds that represent 27 important breeding parents. So they're the result of crosses between um, two of, of these important breeding parents. Now, Honeycrisp is a really important cultivar in the US, and it's also a really important breeding parent from a fruit quality standpoint. Um, in, in these breeding programs as well. So it's highly represented. 112 half sib seedlings have honey crisp as a parent in combination with another parent. Another useful thing about this germplasm set is that not only does it provide this representation, but we also have DNA information on all of these individuals. They were previously genotyped through the Rose Green Project, which will be important for objective two. So how we went about evaluating the resistance and susceptibility of these individuals was through a two-year field, replicated field inoculation study. So all of these individuals were propagated onto a vigorous rootstock. We chose this rootstock because it's vigorous, and we know that vigor plays a really important role in fire blight susceptibility. Higher vigor results in higher susceptibility. So we really wanted to set up these individuals to be as susceptible as possible from a physiology standpoint, 
so that we could really get at the genetics of resistance. There were three trees or replicants per individual and planted at a randomized complete block design. And this is an image of us inoculating part of that planting in 2017. And I'd just like to put this up here just to give you an idea of the size of this experiment, what we're dealing with. Trying to time a, bu a bunch of different genotypes in inoculations can be quite challenging. So how we did this was we challenged each of these individuals with the bacterium through our artificial controlled inoculation. So we did this in 2016 and then 2017. And we inoculated three to 10 actively growing shoots per tree. We wanted to do multiple shoots per, to, per tree because we wanted to really pound these individuals. And we used the cut leaf method, which is exactly what it sounds like. You dip scissors into an inoculum suspension that, clip, that contains the bacteria. You clip the tip of the shoot above the meristem to create a wound that allows for that bacteria to enter into the tree. And then we waited six weeks so symptom progression could cease. And then we went and we measured. So for each individual shoot, we recorded multiple things. We recorded incidents, so presence, absence of any symptoms, total shoot length within the current season's growth, lesion length within the current season's growth, and then we wanted to see how far did that lesion progress if it moved out of first year wood to get a better idea of severity. So zero being no infection, one, first year wood infected, two, second year wood infected, four, all the way into the trunk, that tree's probably not doing that great. But the two measurements that are really important are these two, that total shoot length and the current or lesion length within the current season's growth. From those measurements, we can calculate something called a proportion of shoot length that was blighted, which I'll refer to as SLB. A higher proportion is indicative of a more susceptible response, and a lower proportion, closer to zero, is a lower susceptibility response. And that's a standardized method of evaluating resistance and susceptibility. So we had a lot of data to deal with. So, and we know that fire blight is an inherently variable disease. We not only see variation from tree to tree within a given year, but you'll see variation within a canopy from shoot to shoot, where one shoot completely infected and the other shoot shows no symptoms at all. So to account for some of this variation through our statistical design, I used a mixed linear model to estimate what we call best linear unbiased predictions or BLUFs in the statistical community or sh the shoot length blighted data. And that's just a fancy way of basically saying it's a corrected mean, all right? It's correcting for some of that noise as much as we can. And that's just what, that's what we use to estimate a given individual, a given seedling's resistance or susceptibility. But to remember that we took all this other data, right? We have incidents and we have some maximum severity data. So we can use that data through a process called k-means clustering, which is a, just a statistical technique to group individuals. And we can group them or classify them into resistance and susceptibility groups based on how they compare for these, these um, metrics. So it gives us a better idea of how resistance and susceptibility looks like with the metric process. Just another way of looking at the data. So first of all, let's look at some results for the control. So we're, you'll remember we chose controls because we wanted to make sure that our inoculation procedure was working as expected. We wanted to make sure that individuals that are highly susceptible are showing up as highly susceptible, and individuals that are not, are not showing up as highly susceptible. So we chose these four controls. They span the susceptibility spectrum, and we are going to look at their responses. So on the x-axis of this figure, you have control. On the y-axis, you have the average SLP data, increasing susceptibility from bottom to top, and then the two years worth of data. And what I, I want you to take two things away from this figure. First of all, controls responded as expected. We have highly resistant control, Russian seedling, having very low proportions, very low susceptibility, and highly susceptible control, Jonathan, looking very susceptible. The second thing I want you to take away from this is that control responses were consistent between years. So we had repeatable data from year to year. So that's really important. Our inoculation procedure is working as expected. Now we can actually get to the fun part, looking at the variation within the germ cluster cells. So there's a lot going on in this figure, and I want to take a few moments to walk you all through it. So first of all, ignore the colors. On the x-axis, we have the 2016 SLV bluff. So from left to right within 2016 is increasing susceptibility. On the y-axis, we have the 2017 data. So increasing susceptibility from bottom to top. And those histograms are just another way of looking at the distribution 
of this data within those years. And what I want you to take away from this, while ignoring the colors right now, is that there's variation for fire blight susceptibility and resistance among these seeds, as we would expect. Now, the colors refer to, if you'll remember, those k means clusters. So those groups, based on these metrics, they were grouped together. What we're showing here is just the average SLV data for that, for that within those years. But those groups were determined based on these metrics. So what can we conclude? So that first group, that first cluster, cluster A, has 50 seedlings in it. And these were the lowest susceptibility seedlings. They had very low incidence and severity of infection. Cluster B, that blue group, had 129 seedlings, and these had more moderate responses. So moderate severity as well as incidence. And then cluster C, where the most seedlings fell, had highest susceptibility. So the big question that you're probably asking is, OK, we have this variation on the germplasm set as a whole. But do we actually have variation within the host of families, within those crosses? Or are these seedlings that are in the highly susceptible group right here just the result of highly susceptible by highly susceptible crosses? And are these ones down here just the result of highly resistant by highly resistant? That's the big question that we want to look at. And to look at that, we're going to look at specific families. Again, this is just the overall germplasm set. I removed the ellipses, and then we have that key at the top to remember what K means cluster group that they should fall into. So the first family that we're going to look at is delicious, which is moderately resistant by Honeycrisp, which is moderately susceptible. And there are nine seedlings in this family. And what you can see is that there is a wide range in responses among the seedlings, ranging from way down here, low susceptibility, to very high susceptibility, higher susceptibility than either parent, indicating that those parent phenotypes are not necessarily indicative of what we see in, in the progeny, this variation. How about we look at another family? So we've got Aurora Golden Gala, which is moderately resistant by Enterprise, highly resistant. And what you'll see here is that there is variation within this family, but that variation is shifted, the distribution is shifted down here towards low susceptibility. So either one or both of those parents are strong sources of resistance in this family. And then let's look at a highly susceptible by highly susceptible low cross, braver by ginger ale. This is really interesting. We get a lot of variation within this family in response to fire blight, ranging from relatively low susceptibility all the way to very high susceptibility. This is coming from two highly susceptible parents, indicating that fire blight resistance and susceptibility is genetically complicated. You're getting individuals that have much lower susceptibility than either parent. So what can we conclude from this first objective? Well, first of all, we know that there's variation within this germplasm set, not only for the parents, but also at the, at the progeny or seedling level. And what's really interesting is that there's variation among the progeny within full set families, including within families that are result of highly susceptible by highly susceptible crosses. So what's the next big question? Well, what loci or genetic regions are associated with this observed variation? So that leads us to the second objective, which is to detect loci associated with fire blight resistance in this germplasm set. So how do we go about doing that? Well, on, for each individual seedling, we need two pieces of information. We need the phenotype or that visible characteristic. So in this case, it's going to be that shoot length blighted blood value, our estimate of resistance and susceptibility. And then we need genotypic information or DNA information. That's going to be DNA markers of the seasons. And you'll remember that through the Rosemary Project, we have G DNA information for all of these seasons. So we have those two pieces of information that we need. And once we have these two pieces of information, we can do a statistical analysis approach called marker trait association, where we correlate variation in what we observe, variation in the phenotype, with variation at the DNA level. And the specific approach for those of you who are interested in the audience is called pedigree informed quantitative trait locus analysis or QTL analysis. Now, all a QTL is, is a locus or a specific location in the genome that's associated with a quantitative trait. Fire blight resistance and susceptibility is a quantitative trait. Remember, we get a spectrum and not just two categories. And the specific software that we use, for those of you who are interested, is called FlexQTL. And the reason we chose this software is because it's able to handle the complex nature of this germplasm set. It's able to handle these pedigree connections and these small interconnected families. 
Now keep in mind that the whole point of detecting loci is to get to this point. It's the precursor to developing predictive DNA tests for germplasm characterization, breeding parent selection, and seeding selection. We have to identify the loci before we can develop DNA tests. We're going to walk through some of the results. Um, there's a lot going on in this figure again. Um, this is for the 2016 data only. And what's happening on this figure is on the x-axis, we have chromosome for a subset of Apple's chromosomes. Apple has 17 chromosomes. We're just going to look for simplicity's sake at the ones that have something interesting for this trait in this germ plasm session. So within each of those chromosome boxes, you can imagine that there are a bunch of different DNA markers that allow us to map that chromosome and know exactly where we're at within that chromosome. On the y-axis, we have something called posterior intensity. This is a probability value, basically. The higher the posterior intensity, the higher the probability that that region is associated with our trait, our virus susceptibility. That red dashed line is just our significance threshold, the statistical threshold. And then the percentage values above each of those chromosomes are what we call the percentage of variation explained by that locus. So a higher percentage indicates that that locus that we detect plays a, a more, a larger role in this germ plasm set, um, or where a smaller percentage is a lower role. But keep in mind that we're dealing with a quantitative trait. So we expect relatively low percentage values because we expect multiple loci to be involved with, with this trait. That we're doing. So what can we conclude from the 2016 data? Well, it looks like we're detecting a putative locus at the bottom of chromosome 6, a putative locus somewhere in the middle of chromosome 7, a putative locus at the bottom of chromosome 8, putative locus in the middle of chromosome 15, and then potentially one at the top of chromosome 16. So what happens if we add the 2017 data into the mix? So it's going to be the same figure at the bottom here, but for 2017, with chromosome on the x-axis and posterior intensity on the y. And what we see here is that we're again detecting a putative locus on chromosome 6, 7, 8, and 15. But that locus on chromosome 16 seems to have disappeared, which can happen for a couple reasons. One reason is maybe it was just a statistical artifact in our 2016 data. That's quite common. Another potential reason is that it's something what we call an environmentally dependent focus. So the environmental conditions of 2016 may have resulted in us detecting that locus, whereas in 2017 we didn't. And keep in mind that it, we're using the same trees in both years. So these trees are a year older, right? So there's other physiological things that could potentially be going on in 2016. And we just don't have the capacity to know exactly what that reason is or whatever it is. So we've detected some putative loci. Now how do we go about choosing a locus or a set of loci to target for DNA test development? Well, we need a few things. First, we want to make sure that it's consistent not only in its intensity, but also in the percentage of variation that it's explained. So we want it to be relatively consistent. We also want to make sure that it's consistent in the location that we're detecting it. Is it relatively precise, or are we getting a very broad peak, or is that peak shifting around? So what we're going to look at in the next slide is what we call repeatability. So the first two plots, the top two, should look pretty familiar. They're the 2016 and 2017 results. And this bottom one is when I did a combined year data analysis where I took a, basically an average of both years. And again, on the x-axis, we have chromosome, and on the y-axis, we have posterior intensity. So what are consistent in location? So what we see here is that we're getting a very consistent putative locus at the end of chromosome, or at the bottom of chromosome 6. It looks quite promising. We're getting consistent putative loci on chromosome 7 and 15. We get a peak in all of our data sets on chromosome 8, but that peak tends to be very broad or wide, and it tends to shift in location, which indicates to me that there are potentially multiple loci within that region that are associated with the tra our trait or resistance and susceptibility. But maybe we just don't have a big enough population size, or there's some other things going on that we just can't determine exactly with what lo locus or set of loci are associated with resistance and susceptibility. So chromosome 8 is interesting, but again, we don't really know exactly what's going on. Okay. So we've detected putative loci on chromosome 6, 7, 8, and 15. 
what are the next steps so that we can actually get towards DNA test development and application in every program? So these are ongoing steps, some of which I'm doing and some of which are very much out of the, uh, the range of my dissertation work and for some other student to work on. But so these are some of the things that we need, we need to look at. So we need to characterize these regions or these loci. The first big question that we need to answer is, okay, do they co-localize with previously identified loci in the literature? What does that question mean? Well, there's been a lot of work, especially with wild germplasm, that have identified loci associated with resistance and susceptibility. So the question is, are the ones that we're detecting the same, or are they different? Are these novel ones, or are they, just, are they similar? The next thing we need to look at is resistant versus susceptible, specifically marker haplotypes within those regions. When I talk about haplotypes, these are just sequences of alleles that are inherited together as one block. So you can think of them as a allele in and of itself. So we need to start to figure out, okay, what haplotypes or what alleles are actually associated with resistance or reduced susceptibility, and what haplotypes or alleles are associated with susceptibility. So we can start to determine what should we be selecting for and what should we be selecting against. If you remember back to that initial um, DNA-informed parent selection example where we were selecting for that big R, little r combination and selecting against that little r, little r. And then a big question within these regions, we detected these regions, but we don't necessarily know exactly what's going on with these regions, right? Are there resistance genes within these regions? Or are these genes associated with physiological processes that impact vigor or something else, right? Because we know that there's a lot going on that impact whether or not we see a resistance resistibility. So that's a big question that I will not answer in my dissertation, <laughs> but that's a good question, right? We always have more questions than we ever answer in a given project. Now, I know I say that these, this, these steps are ongoing, but I do want to give you an example of how we can use haplotype information, the real information, what kind of interesting information we can get. So this example is going to come from the chromosome 6 locus, which you'll remember was very consistent in all of our analyses. <coughs> And it's only four seedlings that, have it, that are from Honeycrisp, so that have Honeycrisp as a parent. So at each locus, remember, each individual has two alleles, right? One that's been inherited from the father, one that's been inherited from the mother. So on the x-axis of this figure, you have Honeycrisp's two alleles, blue and gold. This, is, this one that says R are seedlings that have Honeycrisp as a parent, but they have recombination in that region, so they have some sort of combination of those two alleles. So just ignore those for now. They're not really the On the y-axis, we have increase in susceptibility. So from bottom to top, we have increase in susceptibility. So what, what is this figure telling us? Well, the 43 seedlings, these seedlings that have inherited that blue allele, have lower susceptibility than these seedlings that have inherited that gold allele from Honeycrisp. So Honeycrisp appears to have two different alleles within this region, one associated with lower susceptibility and one associated with increased susceptibility. So from a breeding perspective, if we were to select seedlings for one of these alleles, we'd probably want to select them or remove seedlings that have that gold allele because they're more likely to have an increased susceptibility response. So the next big question is, okay, Honeycrisp has these two alleles. Where did it inherit, inherit that blue allele from? Because Honeycrisp, if you remember back to that table, is a moderately susceptible parent. So where did it inherit this allele associated with reduced susceptibility? Well, you remember that we have pedigree information for these individuals, right? They're pedigree connected. We have information about the ancestor. So we can trace these alleles through the pedigree. It's exactly what we're going to do. So for each individual in Honeycrisp pedigree, there are two colored bars. Those are the two haplotypes or two alleles that it has within those regions. Same color means it's the same marker sequence. Ignore most of the colors. Just focus on that blue allele. Honeycrisp appears to have inherited that blue allele from its parent keepsake, which in turn inherited it from frostbite. Right. So Honeycrisp, a moderately susceptible parent, has inherited that reduced susceptibility allele from its parent or grandparent frostbite. Now, the interesting thing about frostbite, if, for those of you who are paying a lot of attention at the beginning of this presentation, is that it was classified as highly resistant in our earlier study. So even though Honeycrisp is moderately susceptible, it appears to have inherited an allele 
associated with reduced susceptibility from its grandparent frostbite, which is shown is highly resistant. So you can imagine that we can do this for other loci, we can do this for other parents, and we can start to get a better idea of what's going on within our germplasm and what should we be selecting against or selecting for to more efficiently breed for fireblight resistance and against susceptibility. So I have thrown a lot of data at you in the last 40 minutes or so, so I just want to take a step back for the next minute or so and talk about the big why question. In graduate school, we're all, always asking the question, why am I doing this? What, the, what are the implications of my work? So let's put it in perspective. What are the implications? So first of all, what has increased our understanding of firelight resistance and susceptibility in germplasm that's breeding relevant? So it's directly relevant to these three major U.S. apple breeding programs. And this will enable more informed parental selection, both from a phenotypic standpoint, from what we see, and also from a genotypic standpoint. Those loci that we've detected will enable the development of predictive DNA tests that breeders can use to efficiently select parents, select against fireblight susceptible seedlings, pyramid multiple resistance alleles for more durable resistance, because remember we want to have multiple resistance genes, pyramid in one, if in cultivar, and most importantly, combine high fruit quality with fireblight resistance, because fireblight resistance is not the be all end of all of a breeding program, right? And I may be the be all end all of my project, but it's not the focus of the breeding program. We want to develop a high quality apple cultivar. And these short-term implications funnel down into a much more long-term implication, which is the development of new improved apple cultivars with durable resistance to firelight for a more sustainable apple industry. Thank you all for your time and attention, and I will take any questions that you may have. resistant phenotypes affected by environmental stresses or different environmental factors? So in, I guess both in central Washington and across. Okay, so the question is how does environmental factors really play a role in resistance and susceptibility both here in Washington and elsewhere in the United States? So I will say that first of all we need to give the context of fire blight in the United States. Fireblight is not actually as big of an issue here as it is elsewhere. So in the East Coast, where they have high humidity and they tend to have hail events, right, where you tend to get these wounds pretty easily, that results in a lot more fireblight. Than you. Environment plays a huge role in resistance and susceptibility, specifically because the way that we evaluate is also impacted by environment. Um, and so what are we detecting? Are we detecting loci that are associated with specifically resistance genes, that's the question, or are they associated with some of these factors that are, are basically an environmental response? So the, the short answer is that environment plays a huge role in a quantitative trait because all of these loci are probably influenced by environment. Um, the, the long answer there is how? Good question. That's another PhD project. <laughs> I don't. Another angle that kind of deal with this uh, environmental factor. So you are 2016, 2017, the, the phenotype data are pretty consistent. Yeah. Right? So if, uh, the, probably not key, right? Or, or, yeah, if uh, other, like a less rainy day or whatever, do you, do you expect that we'll have a very different phenotype data? So the, I'll make two comments. Uh, the first, the question is, if we had not perfect environmental conditions, would we have as consistent of data as right. we, we saw? Uh, the short answer is, of course, we probably would have, wouldn't have seen as consistent. I'll make a comment about 2016 and 2017. Those were horrible years for fire blight for the growers. I got super lucky from my perspective because the conditions just lined up like a perfect storm. The only thing that I will say is that shoot inoculation tends to be more consistent than blossom inoculation because we are directly creating a wound, and as long as that shoot is actively growing, we're likely to get a susceptible response if that individual is susceptible. And we tried to account for some of that by doing multiple shoots per tree. Um, but again, if I did not have the, the perfect environmental conditions, we may not have seen as consistent responses. And I will say that overall, that 
are we had reduced susceptibility overall in 2017 because the conditions weren't quite as good as they were in 2016. Very basic question. How many alleles do you have in Apple? Oh, alleles for a given loci. For, for a given locus, it, it de depends on the germplasm that you're looking at. Quite a few. I can't give you a specific number. Each individual will have two, whether or not it's the same. Depends on what its parents were and what they had. And then it depends on the diversity of the germplasm that you're looking at. So wild germplasm has a lot of novel alleles. This domesticated germplasm is interconnected, so we see a lot of, of the same alleles, especially coming from gold malicious, which is a progenitor for a lot of these. But for any given chromosome, we do have two copies, same as Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They're diploid. Yeah, yeah, they're diploid. Yeah, got it. Unless it's a trick. Unless it's a trick <laughs> one. Well, that's, like, but that's kind of my question. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's where that was even coming from. Thank you. Yes, Kate. yes. Kate, <laughs> point out that defense question, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there is, there is a point in Apple. Typically, domesticated Apple is diploid, but we do have some triploid cultivars. I think Jonagol is is a triploid, um, but we I ignore triploids in this part. Yeah, yeah, but because it has some compl complications for other things. Yeah, Nani. Yeah, the, did you find any anatomical differences between susceptible and resistant cultivars, like where the bacteria moves through, right? So the question is, were there any anatomical differences between cultivars when you have a susceptible versus a resistant individual? That's a really good question. We were looking at a very wide range of germplasm, and we were trying to do a very broad screen. So we didn't look at a lot of those specific uh, anatomical characteristics. That is a big question that has come out of this work is, OK, is the resistance that we're seeing the result of actual resistance genes, or are there structural differences that are resulting in the bacteria not being able to, to move down the tree as, as quickly? Specifically, Enterprise showed really no symptoms, very low susceptibility. So that was a big question on us that I have. And again, there's so many questions, but we weren't able to, we did not look at that. Any other questions? Yeah, I, have a question. uh, I just wondered about uh, if there is any information about the diversity of the pathogen here in both in Washington and uh, within the United States. Um, how is that information considered uh, with the three programs? OK. So the question is, from the pathogen side, is there a lot of diversity? What's the diversity look like in the United States and then in Washington? And how does that information get used in the breeding program? So I'm going to make a disclaimer here. I am not a pathologist. So although we're, I'm working in a patho system, I haven't really focused on the pathogen side of the, the population. We chose to use one strain for simplicity's sake, because the second that you add multiple strains, you're adding another level of complication. Erwinia amlebora as a, as a species is relatively low diversity for a bacteria. Its center of origin is actually in the East Coast, so presumably they have more diversity there. Um, Aves Khan at Cornell University, he's really interested in strain uh, differences and variability, and he's starting to develop some projects that look at that and specifically look at Washington and see, are we really just looking at one strain or multiple strains? We definitely have different strains because we have antibiotic resistance in some individuals. Um, but I can't really speak to, to how, how diverse it is in Washington State. In, in the breeding program, this is, needs to be a consideration. I know in Kate's program she uses, when she does screening selections, basically on the seedling level, she uses, what, three strains that are from Washington? And that's kind of just a, we'll hit it pretty hard and see how that works. But strains obviously changes. You have an evolving system, and it's evolving faster than your host. So Apple. Good question. Uh, suppose you use some, a larger population. You use 300, you know, 314 is pretty a reasonable size. Suppose you use a bigger one. Are you going to pick a, a more low size or fewer? What, what is so we use 314 seedlings, but these are all coming from 20, uh, 32 full set families. So if you use, it depends on the question if you're using larger populations 
within a full city family or larger populations overall as a whole. Um, this was actually a pared down number because we were looking at, I threw out a few families that didn't have enough representation. Um, whether or not we're gonna detect more low side will really depend on the number of families and what's actually segregating within those families. So the question, the answer is I don't know. Sure. But good question. All gonna let me off the hook now. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for your attention. Actually, that's after.